Uh, it is uh, my uh, pleasure uh, to introduce uh, today's speaker, Professor Sagnik Day. But before I do that, I would like to um, convey something about uh, our center, Kiran C. Patel um, Center for Sustainable Development, which uh, always try to have uh, this seminar series has been started two years back and then several great uh, workers and researchers in the field has come uh, across and presented their work. Just last edition was uh, uh, PPM who, who has uh, come in the top 2% of Indian scientists. Um, so, um, and we want to have, uh, we want to have the two way uh, association that uh, a speaker will also come to know about our center and uh, we also uh, come across the work uh, from various uh, great researchers. So the Professor Sainik Day um, is uh, a kind of the MTech and PhD from IIT um, Kanpur. And um, he also worked at uh, uh, three years uh, at University of Illinois, uh, Arvana Campaign, USA. Then he joined the Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi in 2010, July. Um, and uh, since then, he, he has never seen a look at back now almost uh, completed 100 uh, peer reviewed articles. He received INSA Young Scientist a medal in 2008, Nasi Escopus uh, Young Scientist Award in 2012. Dr. Sudhan Sukumar Banerjee MOES Outstanding Young Faculty Fellowship for the period of 1130. And Teaching Excellence Award, I think one of the best that he must be uh, proud of, uh, Teaching Excellence Award from IIT Delhi in 2016. He is an international collaborator and science team member of uh, NASA upcoming um, satellite mission and served as an expert of WHO um, and uh, on global platform on air quality and health. He is collaborator of the uh, global burden of disease studies and local burden of uh, disease studies. Um, I think uh, at the very young age, he has uh, been coordinator for Center for Excellence of Research on Clean Air um, and uh, at IIT Gandhinagar, and he is also a chair professor uh, since July 2019. Um, so he has been serving as an associate editor, which is uh, to the uh, Elsevier Journal Atmospheric Environment, which is a very highly reputed journal. And apart from that, he is editorial board member of Scientific Reports and Earth System Dynamics of uh, uh, European Geophysics Union. Um, this is uh, just a uh, piece, even if I try to remove many. Uh, this much I thought I have to tell. And so Professor Sagnik Day, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Now floor is yours. You will have the 15, uh, 45 to 50 minutes and then we will uh, have the question answer. Session. Yeah, thank you uh, Manish for kind words and, and introduction. Uh, it is a, it's a real pleasure to uh, talk about uh, air pollution and health burden in India uh, in front of all of you. Uh, and IIT Gandhinagar, I already know about uh, the good work being done there. Uh, and I hope actually to further uh, strengthen the collaboration uh, in future with the entire team. Uh, I want to uh, acknowledge the contributions uh, of the work which I am going to show, uh, particularly from my own research group, as well as uh, many collaborators in India, as well as abroad. So uh, what I'm going to talk about today uh, in the next 30 to 40 minutes is uh, first I will uh, demonstrate why addressing air pollution is very, very important uh, in meeting the sustainable development goals. Uh, and then I will talk about uh, perceptions or rather the misconception about uh, health burden of air pollution, especially in the Indian context. Uh, and, and, and why you know that is actually creating a sort of hurdle in, in alleviating the problem. Uh, I will talk about the challenges in India, especially for the exposure assessment and how the health burden estimates are done because uh, people are not very familiar with how actually health burden is being estimated uh, and, and what is the sources of uncertainty, especially for the young researchers, this is very, very important to understand because then only you, know, you can uh, make a plan and, and try to uh, improve the <laughs> estimates. And finally, I will talk about you know, what is the way forward uh, in India. Uh, I want to dedicate this talk uh, to the memory uh, of late Professor Cox made 
who always inspired me and he was actually a public health champion and one uh, very important lesson uh, what he taught me which is actually not just true for air pollution but in general you know about any science uh, that is that you know absence of evidence he used to say that is not the evidence of absence and this is the classic case for india when you talk about the air pollution because quite a long time since there was not much evidence uh, present from india people used to believe that uh, air pollution is not a very big deal in india and and most of the discussion was always uh, focused in delhi uh, but uh, as i will show that you know that is not the case and now people have realized uh, even if it is led but at least you know that realization came and and we have started many uh, important sort of policies and i will also discuss you know some of you know the policies which are relevant and which are not so uh, let me first talk about the connection between air pollution and the various sdgs uh, since this is a sustainable uh, uh, series talk uh, i thought to you know first talk about why air pollution is so important and if you can see that you know uh, you can actually connect air pollution to not just one or two but so many different uh, sustainable development goals Uh, for example if we start with you know the first one uh, it talks about poverty uh, the very uh, latest estimate coming from the global burden of disease india is talking and you know is, is showing that uh, due to air pollution india is losing almost 1.4% of its gdp and that's a huge economic impact uh, and and uh, in fact it's not just the economic impact for the whole country but also at a uh, personal level what has been estimated is that usually every household in india uh, spends almost 10% of the healthcare uh, you know cost in 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 diseases that can be linked to air pollution so clearly you know uh, air pollution has a big impact on economy uh, then if you talk about uh, the sustainable development goal number 2 uh, again you know there are many studies uh, done across the world uh, which have shown that how air pollution may influence the crop yield and again you know agricultural sector is very very important when you talk about mitigating hunger and, and in fact you know uh, among many studies uh, recently we did, i mean couple of years ago we did this study with the colleagues in isi delhi uh, where we have found that in the north indian state alone uh in the last 30 years uh one standard deviation increase in uh, aerosol optical depth this is basically a columnar quantity uh led to almost 5% loss in wheat yield and then there are many other studies which have shown you know how air pollution in india have affected wheat as well as rice and various other crops uh then obviously the health uh, connection which i will discuss in much more detail so clearly you know there is a huge or staggering health burden of air pollution in india so obviously to promote good wealth good health and well being uh, we must uh, reduce air pollution quality education again is very interesting that uh, more recently now studies are coming out uh, where uh, it has been shown that uh, exposure to high air pollution leads to you know uh, or rather you know uh, suppresses the cognitive development especially for the child and so, so those kind of studies were existing for us and various other countries but more recently now there are studies uh, in india in fact uh, two studies uh, recently got published from india where uh, clearly evidence has been given that uh, high air pollution exposure uh, lead to cognitive impairment and if that is the case then obviously the society especially the section of the society uh, which is exposed to higher air pollution uh, those children will be at disadvantage uh you know especially at the young age gender equality again you know from air pollution perspective if you think especially in india what happens is that the women are more exposed to household air pollution much much higher compared to men uh, and in fact at at an india level uh, analysis especially in the latest uh, global burden of disease study has been shown that household air pollution although it has been coming down in india but still uh you know the number is quite high and again you know you can see actually sort of how that may uh hinder in in achieving gender equality uh, affordable and clean energy again uh uh obviously you need clean energy for cleaner air no doubt about that you know we must you know sort of make transition slowly towards the renewable energy or clean energy uh but also what is what has emerged in recent years is that especially the solar power which is a key renewable energy sector in india 
uh, there has been a substantial loss in solar energy resource in India because of the air pollution. Why? There are two, uh, 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 the two reasons for this. One is that these particles get deposited on the solar panels. So if the panels are not periodically cleaned, uh, the efficiency of the production of solar energy reduces. And then obviously, if you have so much pollution in the atmosphere, uh, the sunlight is getting attenuated and you are not all actually getting that much of uh, solar energy at the solar panel itself. And in fact, there is a model-based study uh, done by Mike Bergen's group uh, and who, I mean, who has estimated like India is losing one gigawatt of solar energy due to air pollution. So one of my students is now, uh, you know, he has started looking into this uh, in a more detailed way. And hopefully we will come up with some number, but clearly, you know, uh, there is a strong linkage. And uh, then if you talk about uh, the SDG eight, uh, again, you know, there are now studies emerging and not just globally, but from India, uh, the impact of air pollution and lower labor productivity. And clearly, you know, people are showing that, you know, there is a big loss in labor productivity, especially in those high pollutions and season, which, which we are actually encountering currently. Um, green infrastructure is again, very, very important. If you talk about the uh, SDG nine, uh, then again, uh, inequalities, SDG 10, I will again demonstrate that socially vulnerable uh, people are actually more exposed. Uh, so again, you know, when you talk about air pollution and its health burden, then a particular section of the you know society is 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 more vulnerable than other. Uh, obviously, uh, number eleven, sustainable cities and communities. So urban air pollution is a big problem. National Clean Air Program has been launched to address these issues. So without that, we cannot clearly have the sustainable development of the cities. Uh, and already mentioned about the economic growth uh, must be now uh, dealt with the clean environment. Uh, and and that, that's, there is the connection with the SDG number 12. And obviously, you know, there are hundreds of studies uh, linking air pollution with monsoon, with climate. Uh, and, and how, you know, in, in return, climate can also sort of uh, redistribute the air pollution over India. So you can clearly see that out of almost you know uh, 17 SDGs, you know I have probably you know 13 or 14 here, uh, and and that's that's the that's the importance of addressing air pollutions uh, overall in India. Okay, now uh, to do that we need to understand this entire environmental health pathway, and so if you really see what is this pathway is that you have different sources they emit, and then basically uh, you measure the concentration at certain places. Uh, but whatever you, we are measuring at you know, different locations, especially you know, we have this network maintained by Central Pollution Control Board, uh, that may not may or may not be the exposure. So concentration is one thing, the instruments are giving the concentration, but then we must also calculate uh, what is the exposure. Now, just to give you an idea, like you know, if, just think about two major sources, power plant and vehicles. Now people, who live close to the power plant may not be exposed directly to the power plant emissions because your stack height is probably at 100 meter. So yes, the power plant may be emitting large amount of pollution, but that may be that may affect you know population downwind and not immediately in the vicinity of the power plant. However, in case of vehicles, people who are let's say you know uh, like street street vendors or policemen uh, or even people who are you know traveling by auto, they are exposed to the vehicular emissions because they are actually at the same region. So when you talk about exposure again, uh, uh, it, it's not exactly similar to the concentrations. But then once you know the exposure, then you need to adjust for the dose. Now why it is? Because obviously in a different section of the population has a very different breathing rate. So if I am, let's just, if I start breathing very rapidly, I am inhaling more and more air. So especially you know to talk about the uh, the population as such you know children usually uh, breathe much faster than the adults so when you talk about dose but the same exposure level the dose for a children is much larger than the dose for an adult and that's why you know the impact could be much larger for a children because the dose is much higher and again this needs to be adjusted when you talk about the health impact so once you adjust for the dose yeah obviously then the next step would be to quantify what could be the health impact and once you know the health impact, then you go back and try to uh, reduce the emission at the source level. So this is the typical, you know, the environmental health pathway. 
and unless we address this entire pathway in a seamless manner we will never you know address the air pollution problem and that has been the problem for india because for india mostly for the last 20 to 25 years we focused only on the source and concentrations we never you know uh, perceive air pollution as a public health problem you know for for many years in you know, air pollution has always been seen as okay so there is a pollution you just try to adjust certain sources and mostly the focus has been given in delhi uh, a region and, and not really beyond delhi now also uh, the other challenge is that you know this is an interdisciplinary you know uh, field for example if you talk about the source concentration and all these things uh, it it belongs to environmental or atmospheric science domain but the moment you talk about exposure uh, then it it comes under social science domain because you need to really understand the you know socio economic conditions you know whether the people are exposed they are living conditions the background disease rates and so forth and then obviously when you talk about dose and health response it is the domain of medical science uh, and 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 that's why you know unless we develop this seamless air quality management system uh, according across all these domain uh, we'll never actually resolve the issue uh, and 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 also what is important is that in this entire uh, uh, pathway we uh, there is actually a concept again you know uh, proposed by professor Ms. smith almost 30 years ago uh, this concept is known as the intake fraction and it basically what does it mean is that you know uh, what is the impact or what is the exposure per unit uh, emissions and, and that's what is actually matter when you talk about air pollution mitigation so obviously you need to prioritize the sources uh, for which the exposure at population level is maximum and and, and we'll again demonstrate you know you know what is the case for india let me talk about three major misconceptions about air pollution and its health burden in India. The first one, often it has been said that you know, air pollution is not mentioned in any death certificate. Obviously not. Why? Because the simple answer is that air pollution is not a cause of death. It is just a risk factor. In fact, if you look into the WHO uh, guideline, uh, or not the guideline rather, you know, uh, WHO's this five into five framework, uh, so if you just look into you know what are the major causes uh, uh, from which uh, people have been dying across the world and that's actually what the global burden of disease tries to do uh, it emerges that almost 70 percent of the death globally is coming from non-communicable diseases and out of the non-communicable diseases bulk of them are actually this five set of diseases you know these are the cardiovascular disease respiratory disease cancer, diabetes, and mental and neurological conditions. And what has emerged from global research in the last 30 years or so is that these are the five major risk factors which contribute to all of these diseases. What are these? Unhealthy diet, smoking, excessive use of alcohol, physical inactivity, and air pollution. And clearly you can see that's why that, you know, uh, so air pollution is a risk factor which leads to some of these diseases. And ultimately, these are the cause of death. It's basically the same, you know, as of smoking. But when it comes to smoking, uh, there is no doubt or there is no sense of disbelief that smoking harms. But when it comes to air pollution, I have often seen that, you know, even in the policy making circle, also people sort of, uh, 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 you know, try to uh, uh, get a sense like, you know, okay, yeah, we know that air pollution is bad, but probably it's not impacting our health. The number two uh, misconception, what I would say is that, again, you know, uh, people talk about like cause of death cannot be attributed to air pollution. So I talked about, you know, these different uh, causes or diseases, uh, but the question always comes that, you know, how can you say that these are related to air pollution? You know, uh, with detailed medical history and cohort studies, uh, it is actually possible to attribute, you know, uh, the cause to the risk factors. In fact, that exactly is the sole purpose of the entire global burden of disease exercise. Uh, in fact, the latest uh, disease burden India initiative, which has been led by ICMR and Public Health Foundation of India. Uh, if you look into the major risk factors in India uh, after child and maternal malnutrition, uh, you can see that air pollution stands as the second largest risk factor, way above the dietary risk, you know, uh, blood pressure, which leads to cardiovascular, various cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, like, 
uh, tobacco and then various other uh, risk factors. So yes, you cannot possibly say at an individual level whether this person has developed some disease because of the air pollution, but at a population level, uh, it is possible. The same way actually, again, you know, the argument you can give for the smoking. The third important uh, misconception, uh, again, is that, you know, there is no direct evidence of air pollution exposure. So people always say that, you know, how can you say, you know, there is, uh, you know, whether the exposure is bad or not. They are all actually, I think this is a very good review article. Uh, so now actually there are ways to determine whether a person has been exposed to very high air pollution level or not especially doing the biomarker analysis. Uh, you know, in fact, you know, I just listed three of them, uh, but there are many such biomarkers uh, which can be easily measured from blood or urine sample, and then, you know, they can be easily linked to air pollution. So there are different biomarkers for different type of sources, different type of diseases, uh, but these are now, you know, becoming more and more popular, especially for lung cancer and various cardiovascular and respiratory diseases. So you can clearly see that in you know, all these misconceptions are, are not, you know, they have no really scientific basis. Rather, people should be really cautious and, and proactive and try to reduce the air pollution. Okay, so now let's see actually how is air pollution burden estimated? You know, I have been talking about that. We have now this evidence and all. So uh, when you talk about air pollution burden, uh, there are two different uh, exposure metrics. One is the acute exposure. That means, you know, if let's say uh, uh, we have been living in, in very clean conditions or, you know, in Delhi probably it's not, but uh, in, in some place where the, the pollution level is low and suddenly there is this big pollution episode. Uh, so you can say that, you know, suddenly there is this acute exposure. Even in the Delhi context also, you know, compared to, uh, uh, August, September pollution level, suddenly in October, the pollution or exposure level, you know, almost doubles. Uh, and then obviously you have the chronic exposure. That means, you know, people who have been exposed to very high pollution level, you know, probably their lifetime or, or significant uh, number of years. Now, there are multiple uh, epidemiological study designed to quantify the impact for both acute and chronic exposure. Uh, this is known as the evidence hierarchy uh, triangle. Uh, so if you are at the base of the triangle, uh, these give you a very preliminary indication. And these are actually the part of descriptive epidemiology. So if you are planning you know, some case series or ecological studies or case reports, these are mere correlation. Uh, and, and from mere correlation, you can get some sort of a preliminary indication, but you cannot conclude beyond that. So you have to move up uh, this triangle to get more and more causal evidence. Next group of uh, you know studies design is the cross-sectional or case control studies. Uh, and, and I will demonstrate that our group has been doing this in collaboration with various epidemiologists across the country. So these are actually the studies now which can establish at least the association. And then from the association, you can sort of form an hypothesis. And then for that planning, uh, you can plan sort of uh, uh, cohort studies, which are the next uh, series of you know, study design. And once you do actually cohort studies, then only you can establish the causal biological pathway. However, I must tell you that you know, conducting cohort studies are resource consuming and very time uh, consuming. I mean, typically you need four to five years you know, to conduct a cohort study. And then yet again, you, know, you may not measure you know, all the parameters what you want to measure. So unless there is a sort of sustained uh, funding or sustained in a program to continue such cohort studies, it's, it's very, very difficult to do. But we must do that because in India, we do not have such kind of long-term cohorts. Uh, so most of the evidence, that's why actually we have from Europe or US, where such actually funding was available for the scientists to conduct such cohorts. Uh, then obviously the best is the randomized, con randomized control trial. Uh, However, you know, for air pollution, it is eth ethically difficult to conduct because ideally in randomized control trial, what you have to do is that you have to expose a group of people to extremely high pollution and another group, you know, uh, to, to very clean environments. So obviously you cannot ethically put people, you know, in danger by exposing to higher pollution. So most of the randomized, randomized control trials are, are usually done, you know, you, you with mice and others. So have people trying to understand uh, like the emission from vehicles, how it's impacting my brain, and then try to model for the population. So mostly, you know, uh, in India, uh, 
uh, we are now focused uh, on the high, you know association level or going beyond that you know few cohort studies have started actually to look for the causations so gbd framework uh, what it has done is that uh, it has given a universal framework uh, to do a chronic impact studies and and if you see basically what uh, the way it is calculated is that there are three important parameters here one is the baseline mortality uh, it means that if you just take a particular disease let's say lung cancer now lung cancer can be developed from smoking lung cancer can be developed from uh, air pollution from various other factors baseline mortality is basically the fraction of population dying from lung cancer and if you multiply baseline mortality by population uh, exposed to a you know expose uh, so basically that's the total number of deaths in the population and then there is another important parameter called relative risk and relative risk of one means there is no additional risk of dying from air pollution uh, so this right hand side of the equation is basically telling about what is the uh, or how many you know people uh, actually die from all the factors except air pollution and when you subtract these two you basically get what is the burden attributed solely to air pollution the now the critical component is how do we calculate this relative risk uh, those who are interested you know you can read this book i think this is a very fascinating book where it actually depicts the journey of this global burden of disease how it started this is really a fantastic book to read so the relative risk you know depends on the chronic exposure so if you know what is the chronic exposure at a population level you can calculate the relative risk and you can see that till date uh, for so many diseases the risk functions have been generated how it is done again let me explain very quickly so you can see that uh, the idea is to see how your relative risk varies when your exposure increases now worldwide cohort studies have been done uh, for various uh, conditions for example there are many cohort studies done for ambient air pollution mostly in in developed countries Uh, where pollution level is usually less than 35 microgram per meter cube and then basically you know uh, so these are the let's say you know just uh, pictorial representations then there is a group of studies done for household air pollution and second and smoke obviously you notice that your exposure now has increased uh, significantly now we are in the range of 200 to few thousand and then you have you know all these studies done for active smoking where where, where your exposure is more than 10000 microgram per meter cube now let's say you want to calculate what is the relative risk for indian population where your exposure is around 80 so there are two ways to do it either you extrapolate all the ambient air pollution studies linearly but if you do that and calculate okay for this level of exposure your risk probably is 2.1 or it means that additional 100 uh, 10% uh, risk however uh, the linear extrapolation does not fit because then you know every person uh, smoking would be dead by now and that is not the case because still people live uh, so that is why uh, a non linear uh, function has been developed uh, uh, you know to basically estimate the risk for any of the exposure level and this sort of uh, integrated risk functions now are used in uh, gbd but as i mentioned no single india study actually went in in developing this its function very recently a chinese study came out which sort of fill this large data gap between you know 35 to 200 now i want to show you uh, that over the years these risk functions have changed for example when 2010 uh, this is i think for one particular disease copd chronic obstructive pulmonary disease you can see that 2010 risk function was like this and you also notice this shaded region that is the uncertainty and uh, then over the years based on more and more studies these risk functions keep changing and also over the years population has also in changed and as i mentioned that is not just the exposure or risk but the population and baseline mortality so that has also changed over the years and that is why if you look into the studies look for uh, mortality burden from air pollution in india in the last uh, almost last decade actually this many studies are there which we compiled uh, we are doing a sort of in you know, a collation of all the studies what if what you found is that uh, this estimates vary from 
uh, study to study. No doubt about that. But we need to understand that the reason why these estimates vary because these different studies have used different risk functions, exposure level, as well as you know your background disease rate. Because you know, typically uh, early 21st century, we did not have a very good data set of background disease rates and all. But over the years now that data have improved. So I will say that you know the later years these studies are much more uh, uh, much more robust. That is number one. Number two is that uh, when you talk about health burden of air pollution, uh, this risk function is for PM two point five. But there are many more criteria pollutants like ozone, like sulfur dioxide. So some of these studies only focused on PM two point five. Some of the studies also included ozone and various other pollutants. So again, depending on how many pollutants you are considering, obviously your number varies. But there is absolutely no doubt that the burden, even if you take the smallest number, which is roughly around half million, still half million is very large number. Now, if you want to learn more about the India disease burden, you can just go to the website and all the data are freely available. I think this is just, it would be fun to explore. Uh, now let me tell you that what are the real challenge, you know, challenges for India when you try to calculate this kind of disease burden. So India has four sets of challenge. We have large uncertainty in exposure assessment. We have very patchy health record. In fact, uh, at a national scale, only 20, 20 around 25 percent of the deaths are medically certified. So that means we really do not know 75% of the population, you know, they are dying from what reason. So, and you can understand, you know, the kind of uncertainty that will come when you try to extrapolate this. Uh, obviously, because of this, we are currently unable to uh, validate this kind of estimations. For example, if you, if you ask me like, you know, how do I validate whether 1 million people is dying or not, you cannot unless we develop you know, the system where you sort of have this very detailed medical records and all, we cannot. But now actually the effort has started, you know, uh, especially by the health ministry. And hopefully in, in 10, 10 years time, you know, we will be there. And obviously there is lack of indigenous evidence in India, but now also that has started changing. So in terms of exposure, uh, the challenge is that we have too few ground-based monitoring sites. You know, this is the current, uh, distribution of 230 plus monitoring sites. It is clearly inadequate. We do not have any monitoring at the rural areas. Uh, almost 50% uh, of districts do not have any single monitoring sites in India. So when you try to do exposure based on just the ground-based monitoring, the mean distance to the nearest monitor comes around 80 kilometers. And clearly, you know, that is not an acceptable number. You cannot assess exposure based on measurements done 80 kilometer away. And especially in places like Madhya Pradesh, uh, Orisha and other places, uh, you know, the distribution is even, you know, uh, few. Uh, what has been estimated is that, you know, if India should have an adequate ground-based reference gate monitor, it needs at least $1 billion. Uh, clearly, India does not afford to, you know, cannot afford rather to, you know, invest this much. So the ideal way, uh, what we have been saying is to adopt a hybrid approach where you sort of integrate satellite, low cost sensors and various other things. Uh, we have developed actually a hybrid exposure model uh, for the entire country uh, using satellite data. Uh, I'm not going to details about the uh, methodology and also this paper just got accepted and will be very soon out. Uh, you can go to this website and check about the you know data set. Uh, this is just to show that how good is our uh, data at 24 hour at an annual scale with respect to the uh, CPCB monitors. But once you have this data, you have two advantages. One is that you have a long term data set because you know satellite started measurements of uh, aerosols from 2000, so 20 plus years of data. Uh, which now you can actually uh, study the pollution cycle. For example. Uh, you can see this video animation. Uh, you can see how the pollution cycle moves from January to December over India. Uh, and each day, keep in mind, is 20 year average. So it's not like you know this year something has happened. It's just the 20 year kind of climatological pollution cycles. You can see that now once we are in summer, most of the pollution is lifted up. 
uh, not so much in the gangetic plane uh, and also over the dust region. So these regions are still in, in your yellow and red. And, and you have this constant influx of dust, but as soon as you have this monsoon, now you can see monsoon washes out the pollution, except the arid region, most of the India now is breathing relatively clean air. Situation continues. Uh, occasionally you have this dust transported uh, and you will see that as soon as we finish monsoon and the moment you are in October again, now you can see that you know the pollution build up started and especially in October and November, all this discussion about open burning and all these things, you can see again the pollution has come back to the winter. So clearly this sort of pollution cycle is not just uh, you know, a function of the emissions, but meteorology plays a very, very important role. And if you look into uh, the spatial distribution 20 year average, so clearly this entire region of the Gangetic Plain uh, is where the exposure is more than double the Indian standard. And if you look into the trends over 20 years, you can see that uh, although the Gangetic Plain you know, has very high pollution level, but the pollution has been increasing at a faster rate in Eastern India and some part of the peninsular India. And these are the regions where no attention has been given because most of the discussion always you know is confined to delhi and in the last couple of years it has gone out of delhi and even the national clean air program has been launched it talks about just the city level action plan and clearly when you look at this kind of maps you understand that the entire region is polluted so you cannot do or cannot clear a particular city without talking about regional action plan however the ray of hope is that there has been a recent improvement in the air pollution levels across the country. So uh, what you see here is the pollution percentage change in the pollution level uh, from this year 2016 uh, with respect to 2015. And so when you come to 2019, you can see that uh, from 2018 to 19, almost everywhere uh, in India pollution has gone down by around five to eight, nine, ten percent. Uh, so prob now whether this improvement is uh, due to the actions which the government has taken or not, time will tell because this is too early, but at least, you know, something uh, uh, is working uh, at the ground. So the question comes, you know, how can we meet national standard? In my opinion, we must, you know, prioritize the regional sources. So I will just give you two quick examples. Uh, so with this study we did a couple of years ago, uh, where if, what I'm showing here is the contribution of household emissions to ambient PM 2.5 in India at a district level. And you can see that uh, in many districts, the household contributes to almost 40, 45% to outdoor air pollution. Uh, and then what we found is that if you completely mitigate household emissions, uh, then all the districts which are in blue, they will meet the national standard. And only, few districts remain where you know uh, the national standard is still far away but most of india will meet national standard just by mitigating household emissions government has already undertaken two major policies one is the Ujjwala, uh, and the other one is the rural electrification uh, scheme uh, and both these policies that is why are very very important uh, we must ensure actually effective implementation of the policies the other uh, example is, is from the recent lockdown experience. Uh, what you see here at five maps, so the first one is the pre-lockdown pollution level. And you can see in four different phases, what was the lockdown, uh, 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 what was the concentration or exposure. Uh, and you can see that, yes, there has been a drastic reduction, but the reduction was not sustainable that means you know in lockdown phase one you can see the entire gangetic plane becomes very very clean but not so much the central india similarly in phase two eastern india is again coming up so what i'm trying to say is that the during the lockdown what happened is that most of the uh, urban sources went up like vehicular emission industrial emission power plants are operating at much uh, lower capacity however regional uh, sources like household emissions continued and there was considerable open burning. So again, this highlights the importance of regional sources. Uh, now, this is also very important. So we try to understand that since India has a large health burden, uh, what has contributed to this health burden? And as I already mentioned that 
various socioeconomic uh, factors uh, matter. Uh, so what we estimated is that between 2000 to 2015, uh, the health burden attributed to air pollution in India has gone up by almost 48%. However, this is, most, this is a very, very important point is that uh, just because of the increase or rise in the pollution level, the burden has increased by only 17%. So from 17 to 48%, this increase is mainly because in between the population has increased and the population age structure has shifted to the older age. And obviously older people are more vulnerable from air pollution. So as people are aging, population is increasing, your burden is also increasing. So if we want to reduce the burden, it's not just the air pollution level, but we also need to ensure. Now the good news is that, uh, in the meantime, uh, the baseline mortality that the background disease rates have gone down. And this is mainly because of the improved healthcare. So what I'm trying to say is that we can reduce the burden in addition to reducing air pollution, we must actually uh, improve our overall healthcare system. And that is why, you know, uh, policy like Ayushman, Varot and other policies which are providing universal healthcare coverage is the right step forward. And again, you can see that, you know, air pollution mitigation is not just the uh, domain of scientists. So you need basically an you know, economist, you need social scientists to really come and talk about these socioeconomic conditions, uh, which are also influencing the burden. Now, very quickly, I will talk about two, uh, two or three indigenous studies. Uh, so this is a meta-analysis done uh, by various groups across the world uh, where they looked into the acute impact of PM 2.5 or PM 10 on the all-cause mortality. You can see that there are multiple studies done in US and various other cities. So what people have found is that, uh, what is the percentage change in mortality per 10 microgram per meter cube increase in pollution level? And you can see that Indian studies, obviously most of all the Indian studies are done for PM 10, not PM 2.5. Uh, but still they are uh, in the same range as of the global studies. That is number one observations. We currently, uh, you know, we have just finished this study with PM 2.5. Uh, and we have found that obviously in Delhi, uh, when you talk about PM 2.5, then the risk is slightly larger than PM 10. Uh, but still actually this is in the range, same range. So what it tells us is that uh, first of all, the air pollution impact is no different in the Indian city. So again, you know, this discussion like Indian people uh, are immune and uh, not correct. But at the same time, it also tells us the impact may not be as large as we perceive. So, so definitely, you know, the composition could be a factor where, you know, the especially for the particle that matters, the composition is very, very different in India. Uh, the other study is the you know study done uh, across the world to you see the acute impact of air pollution during pregnancy uh, and again you can see that globally people have found like there is an 86 gram reduction in the birth weight uh, recently in tamil nadu this study also you know estimated the same number the other uh, study what we did with some other colleagues is is the impact on child stunting now Stunting is basically, you know, a very important child growth failure parameter and any stunted child has a very higher risk of developing uh, non-communicable diseases uh, as adults. So we looked into this National Family Health Survey data, uh, which sampled uh, 220,000 children across the country. Uh, and uh, what I'm showing here is that, uh, so if basically, you know, the value is lower than zero, that means the children is stunted. Uh, and above zero is the normal growth. And you can clearly see that urban children in India are much better than rural children. The reason is that uh, the two biggest factor for stunting is the malnutrition and sanitation. However, what we found is that uh, both urban and rural children, uh, the height for uh, age Z score decreases when the pollution level increases during the birth time. Uh, and it means that, you know, at higher pollution level, uh, obviously, you know, the chance of stunting increases. And when we adjust for various confounding factors like genetics and various other uh, factors, we still see the impact of pollution. Sorry. The third study is what we just finished is, you know, again, looking into the association with child anemia. Uh, again, the study design is same, uh, looked into the same uh, uh, National Family Health Survey data. 
Uh, the reason of choosing anemia is that you know, and India has one of the highest anemia prevalence in the world, and you can see that you know, large fraction of uh, population in India actually is anemic. And again, what we found is that when you adjust for various confounding factors, still for every 10 microgram per meter cube increase in PM exposure, uh, anemia prevalence increases by 1.6 percent. And our uh, epidemiologic, uh, you know, colleagues they are sort of developed this hypothesis that why it happens. Uh, so what they're hypothesizing is that, you know, high PM2.5 exposure leads to inflammation, and then it leads to basically uh, changes in, in iron trafficking in the body through secretion of cytokines. This is one of the biomarker I talked about earlier. And the cytosine, uh, cy sorry, cytokine secretion uh, stimulate the liver uh, to produce hepcidin, and it actually then probably inhibits both dietary iron absorption and recycling of iron. And this is probably the biological mechanism due to which prolonged exposure to air pollution may lead to anemia. So now uh, last few slides. Uh, so we talked about you know, how big is the burden and some of the recent evidences of air pollution. Uh, we did this study to project actually how the exposure may change in India in future. Uh, for this, we used uh, 13 semi five models and then we bias corrected the models. And we take actually our baseline uh, for 2000 to 2010. And from the pre-industrial time to uh, end of the 21st century, uh, if we, what I am plotted here is that, you know, the change in PM 2.5 level. And in India, if you really see what happened is that uh, the pollution level remained almost you know, uniform. Uh, uh, and then it started increasing only in, from the 70s decade when India actually started very rapid urbanization and industrialization. And if no major policy is implemented, then in the future, the red line is for RCP 8.5 scenario, a blue line for RCP 4.5 scenario, you can see basically that in two different scenarios, more or less the projection is similar with, with different magnitude. Uh, and then with this kind of exposure, uh, if you try to understand how the burden will change, uh, keep in mind that the pollution, uh, population level is expected to definitely increase. Indian population will uh, uh, shift to older age, but what is also uh, projected is that a better healthcare uh, overall infrastructure in future under various scenarios, and that probably will sort of mitigate some of the increased burden. So due to the change in demography, uh, burden is projected to increase, uh, which partially will get compensated due to the improvement in the uh, healthcare system. Uh, just to give you an idea that, uh, under various scenarios, you know, the difference will get enlarged uh, when you go to the end of the century. My last slide is that, you know, the other thing is that when you try to sort of now think about air pollution mitigation, uh, we looked into two different scenarios for 2030. Uh, one is the baseline emission, so air emission is increasing, and then you have the mitigation. Uh, and then uh, when you project this for future, you see that for baseline, the pollution level will increase. Definitely for mitigation in many parts of the country, pollution level go down. However, uh, what we found is that since you are uh, sort of cleaning the atmosphere, uh, then uh, it could lead to around, you know, additional 0.3 to 0.5 degree warming for this mitigation scenario. However, the good news is that uh, following the mitigation scenario would help almost, you know, 400,000 deaths. Uh, so, the next big question is that uh, move from PM mass to PM toxicity or PM composition, as I mentioned that, you know, this is the thing what in India we need to do. And for this, this NASA mission is coming up. We are working to understand, you know, how important is the composition and Delhi is one of the, you know, key area globally where, where hopefully we'll, you know, once the satellite is launched, we'll get some answer to it. I just want to conclude with four important points saying that India must show now urgency and seriousness in mitigating air pollutions. And it needs a proper stakeholder consultation, which is not happening at the moment. Uh, and, and we must address the air pollution and climate change in an integrated manner, because we need to explore the co-benefits. We cannot afford you know, dealing this separately. Uh, we must invest in exploring new frontiers like the issue of toxicity, as I talked about. And as I mentioned, there is no long-term cohort studies in India, so this needs to be really addressed. And in the recent Boivab summit, these were the two major recommendations. Hopefully in the coming years, this will be done. And 
uh, finally, our curriculum and overall system needs to be highly flexible for interdisciplinary research. And uh, I just want to acknowledge, you know, multiple funding agencies, and uh, I will be very happy to answer any questions. Thank you all.